Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 43. In this lecture, we'll discuss thermodynamic processes. This topic is covered in Chapter 20 of our textbook by Sorway and Jouet. In this lecture, we want to discuss thermodynamic processes. In general, a thermodynamic process refers to any manipulation of any thermodynamic parameters describing a system. However, in this class, we'll adopt a much more limited definition. For us, in this class, a thermodynamic process is any manipulation of the pressure, volume, and temperature of an ideal gas. So for us, a thermodynamic process is a manipulation of three specific parameters, pressure, volume, and temperature, and the systems that we'll consider will be, in most cases, ideal gases. In principle, it's also possible to manipulate the number of particles or molecules in the gas. However, in this class, in most cases, we'll assume that that number is kept constant. Now, we want to describe the thermodynamic process in a very precise manner, and for that purpose, we will use a PV diagram. A PV diagram is essentially a graph of the pressure of the gas versus the volume of the gas. So we will always assume that the gas is in some initial state, described by some initial volume and initial pressure, and then we'll assume that the gas is somehow manipulated, thereby changing its volume and pressure, and the gas eventually ends up in some final state described by some uh, final volume and final pressure. Note that we are talking about an ideal gas here, which is described by the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, which means that at any point along its manipulation or evolution, if we know the pressure and volume, and we assume that N is known and kept constant, then we should be able to figure out the temperature. For example, if we know the number of moles in the gas, and we know what the initial volume and initial pressure are, then we can, in principle, use the ideal gas law to find what the initial temperature is. Therefore, a PV diagram really provides a rather complete description of a thermodynamic process. It's worth mentioning that a PV diagram is not the only way to describe the state of a thermodynamic system. If you've ever taken a chemistry course, you may have seen phase diagrams or PT graphs. A phase diagram is essentially a graph of the pressure of a system versus the temperature of that system. Here you see two examples of phase diagrams. The one on the left is a generic phase diagram. The one on the right is the phase diagram for water. Phase diagrams are useful when you want to discuss phase transitions between the solid, liquid, and gas phases of water, for example. Although phase diagrams or PT graphs are useful, in this class we will not be using them much. We'll be primarily interested in PV diagrams, so keep that distinction in mind. Earlier I described the thermodynamic process as any manipulation of the volume, pressure, or temperature of an ideal gas. As you may have guessed, there are many, virtually infinitely many ways that these three parameters can be manipulated. It turns out, however, that there are four fundamental thermodynamic processes that essentially serve as the building blocks for all other processes. So virtually any process that you can imagine, any manipulation of an ideal gas, could essentially be constructed from a combination of four basic thermodynamic processes. The first of these processes is known as an isochoric process. An isochoric process, also sometimes known as an isovolumetric process, is one in which the volume of the gas does not change. So whenever the pressure and the temperature of an ideal gas are manipulated, but its volume is kept fixed, we can say that we have an isochoric process. An isobaric process is also a fundamental thermodynamic process. An isobaric process is one in which the pressure remains constant. In an isobaric process, the volume and the temperature can change in arbitrary ways, but P initial must equal to P final. 
stated differently, delta P must be zero for an isobaric process. If the ideal gas is manipulated in such a way that its temperature remains constant, then what we have is an isothermal process. In an isothermal process, we can say that the initial temperature is equal to the final temperature for the ideal gas. The fourth fundamental process is perhaps the most difficult to understand, and this is the adiabatic process. In an adiabatic process, the volume and the pressure and the temperature of the gas may all change. However, Q is equal to zero. In other words, the system is not heated. It is, in fact, insulated against heating. So the thermal energy of the system will not change due to heat. We need to understand each one of these four fundamental processes because essentially all other thermodynamic processes can be constructed from a combination of these four. It'll take us a couple of lectures to fully appreciate and understand these four fundamental processes. However, for now, you should be familiar with the terminology here and know the vocabulary. To have a concrete picture of each of the four fundamental thermodynamic processes, you can imagine the following experimental setup. Imagine that you have a cylindrical container that you have filled with some ideal gas. Imagine that the cylinder is capped with a piston. A piston is basically a disc that seals the gas inside the cylinder and is free to move up and down in response to forces or pressures that are applied to the piston. We're going to assume that we have a thermometer that allows us to read the temperature of the gas inside and we have access to a Bunsen burner or a bucket of ice that allow us to add heat or subtract heat from the system. Now, if we could measure the height of the gas, then we could uh, calculate the volume of the gas inside, given that we know the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. Also, if we know the mass that keeps the piston in equilibrium, then we can basically calculate the pressure of the gas. And of course, the temperature of the gas can be read directly from the thermometer. We've discussed this kind of a setup before, so this should look somewhat familiar to you from previous lectures. An example of an isochoric process, one in which the volume does not change, is one where we, for example, stack more masses on the piston, increasing the downward force, while at the same time turning up the Bunsen burner, heating the gas. As we do this, the gas molecules will begin to move faster, their pressure increases, they exert a greater upward force on the piston, and if that force balances the weight of the mass, then the height of the piston remains constant. So that's an example of an isochoric process. The height remained constant and therefore the volume remained constant, but the pressure and the temperature were changed. An example of an isobaric process, one in which the pressure does not change, is one where basically the height is allowed to vary, but the mass is kept constant. So you might, for example, turn up the Bunsen burner, heating the gas, increasing its thermal energy, and then simply allowing the piston to move up. As the piston moves up, the height increases, which means the volume is changing, and the temperature may also change, but because we have not changed the mass on the piston, the pressure of the gas remains constant, and therefore we have an isobaric process. We can use the same setup to discuss an isothermal process. An isothermal process is one in which the temperature does not change. So imagine a process in which the mass is changed and the height is allowed to vary, but at the same time, the heat is adjusted to maintain the temperature at a constant value. So more specifically, imagine that you stack more masses on the piston. Note that as you increase the mass, you're basically changing the pressure of the gas. The added masses will push the piston down, thereby compressing the gas. As you compress the gas, you might notice that the temperature gradually begins to rise, so very quickly you turn down the Bunsen burner. By turning down the flame, you're effectively cooling the gas down and making sure that the temperature remains constant. 
So while the height is changing, which means that the volume is changing, and while the mass is changing, which means the pressure is changing, the temperature is not changing because you're carefully managing the heat source and therefore you've achieved an isothermal process. The fourth fundamental thermodynamic process is an adiabatic process. That's one in which Q is equal to zero. What this means is that heat is not added or subtracted to the system. So imagine that the mass has changed and the height is allowed to vary, but the heat source, the Bunsen burner in this example, is completely eliminated. So we remove the flame, we wrap the cylinder in a thick blanket, let's say, so that we do not allow thermal energy to enter or exit the system. Now we can add masses to the piston, thereby changing the pressure, and we could also compress or allow the gas to expand so the height could change, thereby changing the volume. And as that happens, the temperature could change as well. However, we're not using a heat source to change the thermal energy of the system. As I mentioned earlier, we like to describe thermodynamic processes using PV diagrams. PV diagrams give us a concise and complete description of how the gas is being manipulated. So we'd like to know what the PV graph looks like for each of the four fundamental processes. Those four fundamental processes are depicted here on this PV diagram. The first of these, the vertical orange line that you see here, is a typical graph for an isochoric process. So you might imagine that we're starting the gas in some initial state at this point over here. At that initial state, you can see that the initial volume is 0.5 and the initial pressure is 1, just for example. Then the gas evolves to some final state down here, and in that final state, the volume remains at 0.5 because this is an isochoric process, but notice that the temperature has changed to 0.25. The green graph is a typical graph for an isobaric process. So here we start at some initial state and we uh, evolve the gas to a different final state. Notice that throughout this process, the pressure of the gas remains as one. The pressure must remain constant uh, because it is an isobaric process, but the volume changes. The remaining two graphs represent isothermal and adiabatic processes, although it may not be obvious which is which at this point. It turns out the red graph describes an isothermal process. Note that for an isothermal process, the temperature is constant, so throughout the process depicted by this red graph, the temperature remains at its initial value. So we can use the ideal gas law to basically write down the equation for this graph. By manipulating the ideal gas law, we find that pressure is equal to nRT divided by the volume. The last graph represents an adiabatic process and its equation is given here. In this equation, the constant gamma is known as the specific heat ratio. It's a number that's greater than one, and understanding the specific heat ratio is going to require a few more lectures. So at this point, it is not at all obvious where this equation comes from or what exactly gamma means. For now, simply know the equation and we'll eventually derive this equation after we've laid down some foundation for it. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.